What I want to describe is a technology of circling for the purpose of facilitating trauma awareness, trauma integration, release of the biology of trauma, and the community healing that is necessary to bring the human personas online on the other side of trauma. So a great deal of any journey is the time and dedication to prepare. Trauma is not one of those things unlike some where you can dabble. Trauma is one of the most significant and pivotal human experiences. In its release, we move towards transcendence as we leave the reptilian patterns, enter the human patterns, and at very deep levels of healing, enter the regions of the brain in which through the altered states induced by perhaps the endogenous DMT in our own brains, we lift to a sense of connectedness, a sense of oneness that transcends the illusion of the Western mind, which sees us as isolated, separate individuals, separate from the body of our earth, separate from the body of our family system, separate from our country and each other, as distinct, independent individuals, as opposed to integrated members of a number of ecological systems without which we do not exist, without which they do not exist. Our family does not exist in the same way without us. Our relationship with the earth goes both ways. So to prepare for such an exciting delve into such a transformational moment requires patience. It requires a humility, an anticipation of what's possible when the preparation is thorough. It's very much like going into outer space or uh, into deep diving situations at the bottom of the ocean. If you want to do the deep dives, if you want to take the far journey, every single thing about your equipment must be meticulous, must be understood the airflow, the body's response to pressure, uh, the exact amount of oxygen needed to prepare for such a deep dive is necessary if you want to dive deeply and come out in better health than when you went in. You don't want to learn when you're sitting on a moon base that the next ship is coming in three months and the oxygen supply will last two months, and two weeks. These calculations need to be done in advance, and we do spend the time in a materialistic paradigm, in a materialistic world, we spend the time to study the material. In a more feminine dance with inner space, we are more impatient Oh, who cares if we need uh, oxygen, you know, two weeks before we, we, we're, we depart? Who, who cares if we need three people to support us rather than just one? Eh, it's just inner space. The patronizing diminishment of feminine terrain in a chauvinistic culture, it's just in your head. What if it was reversed? What if everything that was happening out there was, oh, that's just out there? 
Okay, we died out there, but we're still alive as souls. That's the important thing. Uh, you know, sure, someone bashed into our car, but that's, that's just out there. And it is just out there. In here, our thoughts, our feelings, in the triad of heart, mind, and body, it is our thoughts and our feelings that represent two-thirds of our reality. Meaning our body could be taken offline. We could be, you know, we could have our hands, our feet amputated. We could have our eyes closed. And with our thoughts and with our feelings and with our imagination, we could have a much richer world than if the opposite were true. If we killed off the brain and were brain dead and had all of our limbs but no conscious experience, in other words, the inner world is more real. The inner world is more a part of us than just out there. So if we were to inverse the chauvinism, to say just out there, it doesn't matter, it's just the body. What really matters, my heart, my mind, my soul, my spirit, my consciousness, it would be akin to it's just in your head. Ah, who cares about a little death of soul? Who cares about the ding of an inner persona? Of course, the healthy symmetry of yin and yang, masculine and feminine, is to say that in here is as beautiful and important as what's out there. And what's out there is as beautiful and important as what's in here. Each has its quality. Two-thirds of my consciousness is tied up in the heart and the mind, and another third in the body. But the body is so dense that when someone's driving a nail into your hand, it's much louder than the thoughts the feelings that are in here, because the body is so dense. It's only a third of who we are, but it's a dense third. And so in the symmetry, the body, the out there, the masculine, the heart, the dance between heart and mind, the, the inner world, the feminine, the imagination, the explosion of heart and mind, the synergy into the inner world, the polarity. And each are equally valuable. We need to prepare for journeys into inner space as meticulously as we prepare for those journeys into outer space. So what is the preparation for this journey? Well, in an emotionally and trauma illiterate culture, we need to do a lot of the work that in more advanced cultures might take place in high school or uh, middle school. Because truly our emotions and our emotional biology, because you can trigger an emotion by triggering aspects of the brain. We're talking about a dance, a biological dance. So even in that illusionary split between the outer world and the inner world, we realize that in the inner world, it is intricately connected with our biology. You talk about a woman with a bad hair day. There's a connection between what's going on in her body and what's going on in here. You talk about someone who's, you know, stayed up all night drinking beer and the thoughts and the feelings felt the next day are different because of the body exchange. They're not as dissociated as the Western mind that needs to break everything down into boxes of language would lead us to believe. We are much more cohesive. 
Reality is a field of integration and integrity, and it is our positioning of our consciousness in the left lineal brain developed by Western culture that would have us partition. I am this and you are this. I have nothing to do with you. I have nothing to say to you. I don't like that. The fact that my body emerged out of the plants grown in the mud that I don't like is lost on the Western brain, which likes to say mud, ugh. Me, wonderful, mud, ugh. Without mud, there's no plants. Without plants, there's no animals, and there's no food. Without plants, there's no us. So the idea that we can be separate, the idea that we can differentiate something we discussed and something we admire when they are connected, this is a figment of imagination that is just in your head. It's not scientific. It's just in your head. And this is what we're healing with trauma. With shame, we're healing the message that we are separate and that we do not belong. As pack mammalian species, 100,000 years in the trees, well, 100,000 years ago, it's estimated we might have been in the trees. As pack mammalian species, we need to feel through the petting, through the grooming, through the sensuality, through the movement, through the association, through the 24-7 bonding of a pack of mammals. That we are safe because we are integrated, because we are connected, because a single monkey dies of loneliness, of predation, from not getting the communication, from being a target, but a community of monkeys thrives, engages, grows, develops, plays, enjoys, has a life worth living. It's of course, a wonderful exercise to imagine who has the better lifestyle than the typical American or the typical monkey. Monkeys don't pay rent. Monkeys don't have a mortgage payment. Monkeys don't need 401k plans. Monkeys don't need to work at jobs they hate in order to make money to do things they feel compelled to do to look good. Monkeys eat all organic food. Monkeys are fit. They don't need to go to the gym. Are we de-evolving or are we evolving? Obviously, there's a fair amount of both. Coming back into this moment of preparation, of filling in the gaps that our culture has left out of the education menu, we need to know about our biology. We need to know about emotions. There's a number of things that are very valuable to know. One is a book by Alice Miller, For Your Own Good. It's, it's an important piece in understanding the montage, the circle, of silence, of denial, of collusion that is placed on the child to carry for your own good. It does not take too long to listen on Audible to understand the gist. It's an important part of the puzzle. Another valuable piece is either Peter Levine's Healing Trauma or Bessel van der Kolk's 
much more expansive tapestry of the landscape of trauma through time and culture, of the many responses that can and cannot work in our biology. This is an important doorway to open up. Now it can be opening up as a circle, meaning the preparation can be integrating with our circle. This can be done in preparation as individuals. It can also be read together and talked about as a way of building trust, of building intimacy, you see, intimacy in the circle to explore. As part of Bessel's work, the Adverse Childhood Experience Study, the ACE score, is a tool for distinctions that can create more inclusion. Because one of the things that I realized as a 40-year-old man who learned about trauma for the first time after therapy and da-da-da, is I had no idea it applied to me because I didn't fight in Iraq, because I didn't fight in Vietnam. I had no idea that trauma applies to almost all of us. I didn't know what it was. And the beautiful thing with the Adverse Childhood Experience study is it takes all of 10 minutes to get what is called an ACE score. This is part, this is part of preparing connection, making sure that we understand that trauma applies to us that we've all had moments of shame where we felt deeply isolated from the rest of our species, from our community, and that those are traumatic in nature because to be separate from the tribe is a life-threatening reality. When we are, despite our illusions, so interdependent to understand the shames that we've experienced, and what parts of us still feel unwelcome outside the circle. Whenever there is a part of one person who feels unwelcome and outside the circle, there is a part of everyone who feels unwelcome and outside the circle. It is a game we win together by including every part of who we are as a species with understanding, with empathy, with fear, with grief, with rage, but including those emotions, including the awareness that every part of humanity is a part of us as a reality, as a probability field, or as a possibility field. And some of us have never murdered, have never raped someone. But we have that possibility. Others of us have never molested a child, but we have that probability or that possibility. It is a part of us. Others of us have never invented the internet, have never invented underwater deep sea diving, have never created their first billion, have never had a certain kind of child, a certain kind of relationship, but it is a probability or a possibility, maybe very unlikely for us, but it is still part of our possibility field. And when we exclude it and dissociate completely, however remote the possibility, we are dissociating from a part of ourselves, a part of nature. Because despite the illusion of the Western mind, we are part of nature. 
And even the illusion of the Western mind is part of nature. We do not exist without the food that gives us sustenance. We are part of the possibility field and the probability field and the actual field of what this Gaian planet has produced. This Gaian planet has produced one mammalian species that has gone about hacking at most of the rest of the mammalian species on the planet. We have emerged out of the womb of our planet. And without the oxygen of this planet, without the food, the drink, the environment, the space, the time provided by this planet, we vanish back into the planet that no longer provides what we need to survive. We are not independent, not in the slightest. Four minutes later, you're dead without the oxygen provided by her gifts. By the ecological relationship that we can never be separate from. It's an interesting thing to con contemplate. How did an earth give birth to something so competent? so efficient at transforming, at destroying, at changing, at polluting, at growing? What is the story that we use to describe what we're about at this moment in time, in which in our, our human history and the history of the planet, we do not know another time that this has happened in this way. And there are many stories, and they are all true in one respect or another. Another doorway to explore, and let's pause here, let's pause and integrate. As part of the journey of intimacy, as part of the journey of intimacy, who in the circle has that little bit of extra femininity of being highly sensitive? Now, Dr. Elaine Aaron has done brain studies to show that there's a percentage of our population depending on where you do the cutoff point, it's in the 10 to 20% range in many mammalian species, including human beings. That 10 to 20% of our friends are highly sensitive, meaning their brain responds more to certain aspects of the environment, perhaps emotionally, perhaps imaginatively, than the other 80%. This is key because it's like having three microphones in a group. And two of the microphones, you talk and you, can, you have to talk quite loudly because they're not very responsive to talk right into the microphone. Hello, can you hear me back there? Okay, I'm gonna talk loud like this so you can hear me. Two of the microphones are like that, but the other one, you get within three feet of the microphone, and it's, ah, it's quite loud, except nobody hears how loud it is, except the person who is that microphone, who picks stuff up much more sensitively and responsively than the other two microphones who do not know in most cases in an 
psychologically illiterate culture that there is such a distinction. And like most of the things we do in our culture, when we do not know, and we don't know that we don't know, and we are impatient to know, because remember, the chauvinism says, if it's all in your head, it doesn't matter, because that's on the inside. You know, true chauvinism would have to say, well, if it's all in your head, and you don't have thoughts, and you don't have feelings, without the chemistry of the body, then the same chauvinism that leaves me to supposedly value the body or the external more than the heart and the mind must value it anyway because they are intricately connected. Every thought changes our biology. Every biological change changes our thought. Every emotion changes our biology. Every Change in our biology changes our emotions. You be in a bad mood and you eat something sweet and it's, it's, it's a painkiller. We can start dealing a little bit less crabbly. We can drink some coffee and we can think clearer. There is a biological dance with every thought and feeling. It's just for the purposes of our dissociative Western mind that we create these illusionary distinctions to begin with. But we need to know who in the group is the sensitive microphone so that we can learn respect, respect to look and look again outside the preconception to actually perceive. Ah, I thought I would have this impact. I perceive I have this one. Let's learn about this. This is part of engaging. And again, every individual has a sensitive side, a persona in them that is extraordinarily sensitive. But then that is represented by there being sensitive people, people who hear things more loudly, who feel things more intensely, who see things in their mind more vividly, who are sensitive, and a 10-minute test. Are you highly sensitive? This test needs to be done and the information conveyed to bring it to the group. A sensitive has a very valuable role because like a canary in a coal mine, in one of the relevant paradigms for this, like a canary in the coal mine, a sensitive will feel something is off before anyone else feels it in the group. A sensitive will feel there's an opportunity that nobody else sees. A canary will know this air is not safe to breathe and can save the life of the miners by dropping dead before the miners follow suit for the invisible gases that are in the atmosphere that human beings lack the sensitivity to perceive. Now this is a, a, a rather crude and sociopathic use for sensitives, but it nonetheless points to a reality that when you honor and take care of the minorities in your group, the sensitives among them, you also take care of the rest of the group who have the same issues, just a little bit less finely tuned. It's kind of like an early warning system about the time that the sensitive can't stand the group dynamic and has got to have a space it's probably a good time to take a pause and integrate, even if the group could go further before it feels the same thing. Ah, we're getting to that point, so let's pause here. It's, it's, it facilitates grace. So when we have our ACE score, when we understand trauma, when we understand the group dynamic, in the process of meeting and moving and talking about these issues, 
when the group is ready, when there is trust and trustworthiness, the understanding of container, container is feminine space. This is the point when we start moving into the virginal terrain of integrating heart, mind, and body, where a group supports an individual to go out on a limb into the traumatic terrain that they need to deal with, into the traumatic terrain that they need to deal with, that they cannot deal with alone. Here's a little example. The ego is the illusion of the separate self. And to create that illusion, when the reality is, it's kind of like, if I look through here, I say that I'm an I. Now, if you look out here, you can say I'm a body with an I inter- you know, interacting with the body. When we look through the ego lens, we say, it's me. When we look through the ecological lens, we say I am part of an energy field that affects myself and others, that is interdependent emotionally, physically, mentally. I'm part of an energy field. I'm part of a body. And my role in the body seems to be to, to see things uh, visually. And then I send that information to some other part that isn't me, but that processes the information, and then some other part that isn't me because I'm only this I. The ego is a zoomed-in part of a certain aspect of reality. And within the ego, we have a memory system that records everything this zoom-in lens has seen. I saw this, then I saw this, then I moved over here, then I thought this, then I saw this. This is me, and this stuff is not me. I'm I'm this. You dissolve the boundary, and it's an integrated system. This is the ego lens. When trauma hits, it is an overwhelming message that fills every point of the ego lens. Now, this hand is not the be-all and end-all of the entire universe. It is just a hand. But it is bigger than the ego. Meaning when the ego is up in close with this experience of the hand, there's hand to the left, hand to the right, hand above, hand below. There's nowhere but hand. Now this creates an overwhelming experience when it is painful and life-threatening called trauma. And the, the ego can't deal with it because there's no perspective. You see, the ego can deal with this. A little bit of pain in in the ego, I've got 20% pain. Well, what does the rest of me do? Well, it's just 20%. It's not me. But when you have 100% pain, overwhelm, trauma, shame, the ego can't deal with it. And the ego requires another ego who's not in the field. So the ego's here dealing with pain. It needs another ego that's out here looking at other bits of reality that is not that trauma. It needs a group, a circle around it that feels and understands the ego's trauma, pain, threat to life, message of shame, overwhelm, grief, etc. It feels it, it understands it, but is bigger than it. And this is where you need a circle. You need a circle that is bigger than the issue that the egos in that circle are trying to heal. Because this is such an overwhelming experience for the ego to be in this place that as soon as you go into the trauma, like let's look at that trauma, and you regress and you're there. It's like, I have nowhere to go. I'm completely helpless. I don't know what to do. Right in that place, you cannot get out. You need people on the outside to ground you, to take you out and say, ah, you are in this place that is absolutely overwhelming and cannot see clearly and cannot get out. And it's not your job to get out. Don't worry about it. We are outside of your set, set theory and mathematics, that there are a variety of paradigms, of sets, so to speak, like a theater. And if you are on a theater stage and you're King Lear or you're you know, Hamlet or whatever, and the, the, the murdering sword is coming towards you and you are going to be killed in your set, in your theater. It is the end of everything because that's all there is, is your theater, in your set. But what set theory 
explains mathematically is you have to get outside your set to understand the set fully. You have to understand why did people come to a theater to see this one person dying? You have to understand that the people watching the theater are not feeling like they're dying. They're understanding a part of them dying, but they're outside the set, and so they have more perspective than the person on the set who's dying. You have to get outside your set. You need people who are outside of your paradigms, outside of your reality, who understand that this is a tiny bit of reality. The ego thinks it's everything because to the zoomed in lens, they don't see anything else. That's what the ego should do. This is the nature of trauma. There's nothing wrong with a zoomed in lens being completely covered by a palm of a hand. This lens is not very big. The ego is not very big in the scheme of things. But that's where you need other egos. We need an ego. It's, it's the lens we look through. I see this. Now I see this. Now I see this. We would not see that without an ego. That's the purpose of an ego. But when trauma hits, we need a group. Absolutely key. So the role of the group is to hold the reality that is bigger than the trauma and the ego in trauma while supporting and understanding the trauma. And this is why we have groups of 10 people. Two or three of the group might get lost in the trauma dealing with stuff of their own that's getting triggered. Oh my gosh, gosh, I can imagine how you're, you're this and that. They, 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 they fall in to the zoom in lens and they're right there. They're not able to hold the space. Or maybe one person is able to hold the space, but it's tenuous. And the person who's in trauma, who can't think and can't feel, oh my gosh, I'm going to die, can't rely on one person. It's kind of like a drowning person. They can pull them down. But when you have, no, 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 no. Three, four people in this group may be wobbling Someone may have jumped in there with you and be drowning in there with you. But six or more of us, we're not going anywhere. We are going to hold the space. We are going to hold the circle until you come out. We're not going to move. We're not going to collapse. We're not going to go into panic and say the world is going to come to an end because your world is coming to an end in this moment of trauma. We're going to hold the space. And through us, you will remember that there is a bigger part of the space-time continuum than the moment that is filling and flooding your lens. It's called flooding. If your entire mouth is full with water, you are drowning. But that does not mean the entire universe is filled with water. Now, when we're dealing psychologically, just understanding that the entire universe is not drowning in trauma. And you will not be left alone. Your body will not be left to die by this group just because your ego cannot see a way out of this trauma. It's the power of community, the power of circling. And because trauma is a 200 million year old program, and because it triggers the fight, flight, freeze dynamics of the reptile. Crocodiles, 200 million years old. They have three gears in their predatory need to survive. And if you look closely in the evolution of our planet, in which all of life is moving through these different stages, from fish to bird, from bird to fish, from fish to climbing on the land, to the lizards, to becoming more mammalian, and all these different evolutions. We have the entire history of the planet inside our own body. We carry a microcosm of billions of years of evolution. We have the mineral evolution. We have the plant evolution. We have the animal evolution. And so we have the ability to revert to a reptilian program fight, flight, freeze, when no one is around to help. When we create a fight, flight, freeze dynamic, trauma spreads in a group. It's like a virus. 
Gary Slotkin and his great research on the epidemic of violence, communicates, elucidates a very important point from the perspective of an epidemiologist, someone who studies epidemics. And the point is this, that when you are in a state of violence, you are very likely contagious, meaning the best way to predict whether the next stage of or state of violence will erupt, number one, number two, the best way to predict where the next violent act will be done is right next to the last one, either by the same person or someone else. When violence erupts like a fire, it catches. And so you have to contain it like a fire to treat it like a viral entity. Violence begets violence. Fire begets fire. Water begets water. It, 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 can, 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 it spreads. Now, in this, this is the primary, this is the reason we're doing this together. We're doing it together for a number of reasons. We're doing this to heal shame. Shame is the message of exclusion. When you deal with taboo topics in a group, you heal the message of the taboo, which is that if you felt this, that if you saw this, that if this happened to you, that if you did this to someone, you no longer belong to humanity because you're in a culture that is too immature to address it. I mean, we are in a culture that is too immature to address its taboos. That's why they're taboos. We lack the sophistication. We lack the science to address our own biology and our own culture. So we produce pedophilic behavior. We produce violence. We produce rape. We produce chauvinism. We produce shame. We produce anger and rage. We produce helplessness. And we say, we don't want to deal with what we've produced. It's the illusion created in the Western mind called garbage. You see, nature doesn't have any garbage. Take the food system. You use manure to fertilize food, and then you eat the food, and you create manure to fertilize food, and then you eat the food, and you create the manure to fertilize food. There's no waste. Waste happens in these bizarre mental constructs of human beings. Now, the illusion of waste is the phenomena in which a culture lacks the intelligence, the science, and the imagination to take the energy it has turned into a given form and transform that energy into back into the ecology. I mean, our earth is our ecology. So when we pull oil and stuff out of the earth, turn it into plastic, and then lack the imagination, the technology, the intelligence to turn that plastic back into something that supports the nature that gave birth to the plastic, we say, help, I don't know what to do. I know this is bad stuff. Let's dig a hole in the ground and throw it in there and get it away from me. I don't know what to do with it. So I'll just invent a word called garbage, something that does not exist in nature. It, I'll just invent it. Garbage is what? Well, garbage is anything I don't know what to do with. Okay, now we have a word. Now we have an object. And in a sociopathic, dissociated paradigm of thinking, I want this. This produces these things that I don't know what to do with. Okay, I will just call those all things garbage. And I will spend more energy of nature, oil and stuff, hauling them off, you know, hundreds of miles into pits in the ground and just burying them. Now, 
this is obviously not a sustainable system because I weigh 160 pounds, but in the course of living an American life, I am going to generate 102 tons of garbage. Meaning I'm going to produce, as a part of living, consistently with my cult or my culture, I'm going to produce not 100 ton pounds. I mean, let's say you know, I'm 160 pounds, so in order for 160 pounds to exist, I produce, by the time I die, 100 pounds. That would mean I've more, I've, you know, I've turned half of my own weight into something that has no relationship with the rest of the planet. It's killing animals rather than feeding them. It's, it's doing all this stuff. No, no, no. I'm going to create 102 tons of stuff buried in some hole, burned in the atmosphere, floating around the ocean, that's actively destroying the very things that gave me life. This is called cancer. And it's actually a very interesting metaphor because cancer is a hyperactive growth within a body system that produces rapid amount of change that destroys the host body. And cancer is very alive, very creative, very, very innovative, has lots of sex, creates tons of, tons of cells in there. But the byproduct is that the host body dies. There's less energy for the host and it attacks the host. That's what cancer is and does. Now, when we create tons and tons of manufacturing stuff. We are producing tons and tons of stuff that has nothing to do with the environment. And it is interesting that the things that we create as a species, the inventions that we make, that we deposit back to the ecology in a way that is toxic, meaning it's out of, it's out of attunement. It does not support an existing relationship cycle. You know, when we give our manure back to the environment in the right way, plants grow. That's part of a cycle. When we give lead acid batteries back to the cycle, plants don't grow, they die. And the concentrations of toxins of different chemicals kill more plants and they change the water structure. And then when we drink the water and we consume the chemicals created by this anomalous performance, we develop cancer. Meaning, whether it's tobacco laced with chemicals, whether it's pollution, whether it's smog, everything that's creating cancer in our own body is identical to what's creating cancer in the ecology, which can all be viewed through the lens of does this support and attune to an existing relationship? I give a gift to you on your birthday. You give a gift to me to my birthday. I give a gift to you on your birthday. You give a gift to me on my birthday. And oh, wait, I dump toxic chemicals on you on your birthday. You die, and now there's no gift to me on my birthday. It's the, the relationship is interrupted. I take this area out of the earth, I give this area back to the earth, I take this area out of the earth, I give this area back to the earth, and it's in a relationship. I take this out of the earth, I turn it into something that the earth doesn't need, that the earth doesn't want, that kills plants, that kills animals, that distracts me. You know, these addicting phone dynamics distract me from what, from my, so I'm less aware of the earth. As I'm killing the earth, I'm less aware of it. And then I keep poisoning the earth. And then I start consuming the poisons because we forgot that there is no separate relationship. What's out there is what's in here. We forgot. So I've now put the earth out of balance. And now I'm eating air and water and food from an imbalanced system. Now it's making my body imbalanced. And now I have cancer. 
So it's and it's and it's not I did this. It's we did this because that's the illusion. Well, I didn't. I didn't put nuclear waste in that area. I buy all recycled food. I eat all organic. I do. That's part of the message, right? It doesn't matter what you do. It matters what we do. Because you're not separate. No, but I can't take responsibility for what they're doing. That's them. No. It's interconnected. That's the Western brain talking. You didn't exist if they didn't give birth to you. They don't get to do what they're doing unless we allow it. No, no, no. It's not check, check, check. I buy recycled paper. I did this. I eat organic food. I don't do this. I'm perfectly living. And I'm living right next to 500 neighbors who are dumping waste and doing this and doing that. And they're doing it into our environment. And my organic food is tainted by the oxygen coming in laced with cyanide, laced with this, laced with the pesticides from the non-organic farms around. It's interconnected. So either we all win or none of us win over time. Oh, sure, eating organic is going to keep your body cleaner for a while. But over time, over time, These systems work together. The groundwater from the unorganic farm moves over into the organic farm and vice versa. There is no partition just because the Western brain said, you own this bit of land, I own this bit of land, I keep my part of the river nice, and you dump oil in yours, it comes into my area. It's interconnected. And there is no, well, I take care of my family, and my family doesn't have trauma, and my family... But who cares about these other people over here? Yes, these young girls are being molested. And yeah, you know, and what idiotic parents. That's not my job. This is my job. Until people interact and the sexually abused man that you didn't care about rapes your daughter and doesn't think anything of it because nobody thought anything of his rape the rape of his feminine self that was shamed since birth. Yeah, that's those guys. Yeah, guys without which you don't have a species. You know, it's it's this constant game of the Western mind to say, that's not me, so I'm not going to respond. Versus, we are part of an ecological system, And if I see something out of balance over here, let me see what I can do. And if I see something out of balance over here, let me see what I can do. And absolutely, I cannot do it alone. We are connected. We have to heal this illusion of separation. And that's part of what group work is all about. That's what the circle is about. When you understand that 10 strangers who you wouldn't have felt anything about, who you wouldn't have given any money to. Ten strangers come together and by the end of it, in a truly transcendent work, you might feel honored to die to protect something good in them, to take a risk, to put your neck out there. And when you have that experience with ten strangers, even the Western delusional mind starts opening up to say, wow, what about the whole world of strangers out there who might die for me if we had the honor of doing this deep work together? There is a world surrounded by potential allies, by potential partners, but we need to build the mental, emotional, biological relationships to realize, to make real the integration of our systems and species that we have separated through the trauma of Western culture. 
The trauma of Western culture is that when you are treated as completely worthless and meaningless, as less valuable than bits of paper since the time you were born, when your family put you second to getting more bits of paper, stuck you in some daycare and stuff with, you were unattuned, they, all that mattered was it was low cost. And then they stuck you in front of the TV because that would distract and create some adrenaline while they could do this so they could get more bits of paper. And they did this and they did. When you wake up and you realize, I have been put second to bits of paper my entire life by people who dissociated from their impact and their feelings. And I'm supposed to pull out of this that we are connected, that people are more important than paper, that I would be honored to do something for you when you really need it. It's very confusing for someone raised in a culture that is this dissociative. And that's what's the core. That's the essence. It's the byproduct of connecting physically, emotionally, and mentally. Because if you just see it on TV and you're not dancing, you just see it on TV and you didn't hold this person. If you just see it on TV, it's connecting with the brain. But there's no emotion. There's desensitization. It's not my biology. Again, in the Western chauvinism, the brain is all that matters. I see that. I know that. I know that. I know that. No, you don't. Your body doesn't know it. Your body doesn't know what that feels like. Your body doesn't know what it feels like to hold someone weeping like that. Your body doesn't know what it's like to be held by this person or this person or this person when you are in grief. And TV will never replace the ritual of establishing biological relationships through the five senses. It is a whole new level of honoring who we are, of reestablishing community, and it creates beings. It creates states of beauty, of potency, power, of resilience, the immune system of interconnecting individuals physically, emotionally, biologically, in a process of healing the deepest wounds that require group and community support, of transcending the myopia of the individual trauma and ego to rejoin the life cycle. This is great work. And it requires you. It requires community. It requires honoring that in each one of us, that our cult of myopic thinking has told us to dissociate from, to discount, to deflect, to ignore, to marginalize, and bringing it back into the center so that we can be whole. It is a journey in a materialistic and addictive frenzy in which a thousand hits of adrenaline are offered at every turn, people competing. You see, because when you have a traumatized culture without relief, you need a survival strategy, a coping mechanism to deal with the pain and the overwhelm and the fear created by that isolation. So you have sex, and you have drugs, and you have alcohol, and you have cigarettes, and you have uppers and downers and shoppings and neon lights. And if you pay attention to all of that, you can tune out for a while from these deep regions of the psyche. But 
if for no other reason that you already have it all, this is actually a great liberation. If, you know, I, I remember collapsing in my perfect house with my perfect job, with my perfect money, with my perfect car, with everything that I could think that I could possibly want. And I'm more exhausted and in more pain because there's no, there's no distraction. I've done it. I've done the bucket list. There's nothing hanging over my head. All that remains is the grief that my entire life, core parts of who I am, have never been honored, never been included in community. And I could have a hundred cars and it would not change that variable. And I can stuff my face, I can travel anywhere in the world and it will not change that reality. That part of my body, part of my psyche, part of my soul is in pain from the dissociative illusion of our culture being enacted ritually day after day after day for 10,000 years. And it requires a medicine of a different nature, a ritual, a dance of a different nature for different reasons, different paradigms, different values, different behaviors for different reasons with profoundly unique results medicinal results. It is an upturning of our culture's paradigm to put people first, to put the soul first, to put the feminine on an equal footing in men and in women. We have both in each gender. And the biggest crime is not that women are not allowed to be firefighters. So the biggest crime is that both men and women are not allowed to be spontaneously vulnerable, to honor their sensitivity, to be seen in the depths of their emotions, to explore what it means to be part of a planet, to be in community where things are decided together as opposed to the myopic hedonism of the consumeristic individual who has been sold this bill of lies, this bill of lies that says what's most valuable is your ability to buy things when you want, how you want, in whatever color and size you want, and that that's it. You've succeeded. You can buy this, and then you can buy this, and it will be shipped quickly and accurately, You've, made, you've got it made. That's all you need. But I can't buy a hug. I can't buy a transformation of my biology through dance. I can't buy a 2 a.m. listener to my deepest fears. That's not on the market. Because in the hedonistic, chauvinistic, individualistic, materialistic paradigm of the cult, who needs that? That's just in your head. Who needs it is half of who every man and every woman is. Who needs it is the soul. The soul that is the circle, that is the sacred feminine that walks the edges of a round that understands that the begin, the beginning is also the end. That it is the most graceful, efficient, and elegant shape in history. We don't make bicycles with straight lines. We don't make bicycles with square wheels because it would take too much energy. But we make factories with straight lines where stuff comes in, and gets thrown into the garbage, and that's the end of it. It's a straight line. And we just ignore it and make something else and throw it into the garbage, and that's a straight line. 
This is not graceful. The graceful is the circle of taking every bit of energy out of the system and putting it back into the system in a more complex and more useful form than we took it out. And we breathe in the air of the trees and then we give back food for the trees. It is a system. It is a circle. And it is a beautiful shape. So to the circle, as we emerge as a trustworthy, as a trusting group, as we emerged as an emotionally illiterate, moving into a literate, an aware, an emotionally aware group, as a trauma-aware group, as we emerge as a circle, how do we hold space? And to do the deep dives, there are many, many shallow dive points where you... Let's have everyone say two words about how you're feeling. That's a shallow dive. I'm feeling cozy and toasty. Next, a shallow dive. Trauma does not respond to shallow dives. We need a 90-minute container for people to use 30 to 90 minutes as needed. For people to go in as deeply as they need to be able to go in. We need to open up the right spatial brain to find the positions in the body that hold certain emotions, to express the shape and drawing. So let's just imagine we've gathered as a circle that knows and holds space for one another, and it is your turn to be held in the circle. The mystery of how you unravel to your core is your mystery. And the different filters that you place to see if people are paying attention, to see if people are safe, to see if people can hold the different parts of you that you give birth to, that you awaken to, is also your own. You may decide to see how patient the group is, how sensitive and talk for 90 minutes and see if they can hold there with you or if they fall asleep. If they fall asleep, you may decide, I'm not going to go into those deep waters just yet. But in your space, you will unravel, maybe talk some, maybe draw some, maybe position people into what is called a constellation, where in order to be visible in the shape that you are frozen in, you have to position people that are pushing that shape onto you. You are my mother sending energy like this and I can't move. You are my father doing this. You position people. This is a constellation. And they will get into the energy and start to understand you on a biological and an emotional and an image level. Technologies that we have lost in the obsession with the rational lineal brain. Constellation, drawing, sound, pictures, needs. I need to be touched like this. I need to be held like this. I need to be moved like this. I need to be seen like this. I need this to be said to me. And you work with the group in a way that you cannot work alone. And things change in the group that cannot change alone. And things change in the circle that will not and cannot change in therapy because therapists don't have 10 people to hold this, to hold that, because the drawing is not welcome, because the embodiment is not welcome. And it's in your body that the residue, that the chemicals, that the memories are held. And these have often been masked over by abusive needs needs of the abuser, of the parent, of the culture that needs to know that this will not be talked about because it appears in our culture that we need to work these manic hours and do this and do that so we can buy our granite countertops so we can raise the cost of living from in Palawan in the Philippines when I visited the native tribes there, it costs $100 to build a beautiful bamboo hut that lasts 10 years and then biodegrades back in the soil. These people have no hurried lives. 
They're not buying into the delusion that they've got to have granite countertops and this finish and stainless steel this and this and that and the other. And so they can't possibly take time to spend time with their children or their feelings or listen to their spouse's deep trauma or anything like that. Can't possibly do that because that's just in your head. No, it's in your biology, it's in the Earth's biology. It's the most important thing in the world. It's just that the richest people in the world don't have the time in their fictitious fantasy to do the most important things. This peaceful family that spends $100 a year on nails every eight years and creates a completely sustainable cycle, which even the nails rust back as iron into the soil. They had all the time in the world to talk, and they were peaceful, and their environment was beautiful. The air quality, the noise quality, the warmth, the relationships, 500% more dynamic, complex, more beautiful, more sustainable, a higher quality of life. Could our addictive brains, managing so much pain created by these addictions, relax into such an intelligent world? This is a baby step. Three hours a week, three hours every 10 days or so, a baby step of stepping back into sanity, of giving birth to something more healthy than the three hours we spend every day watching TV to addict ourselves, the three hours we spend rushing around doing this and this and this so that we can buy things to pump our bodies with adrenaline so that these veiled pains do not come to light. And so that when we do, we can put up a social mask and say, everything is fine. It's wonderful and a game face that can convince everyone else with a game face that it's all wonderful. When there have been parts of our soul weeping and crying since birth that have not been honored once, that have been maybe seen for a few seconds, that have crept out on a lonely night in the fog and been held by the grace of her body, our earth, alone in nature, but never shared with the species of which we are a part. These magics are alchemical. We're dealing with alchemy, the alchemy of our biology, the alchemy of our inner world, the alchemy of our outer world, and they are interconnected ecologies. As you step in to the dance, as you step in to the beauty of the moment, to the surrender of innocence in which you do not know what you do not know, but it is a welcome guest nonetheless, because in a circle we are ready for the horrific unknown and the beautiful unknown that both lie out there beyond the myopic view of what an individual self can see. It lies out beyond the edge of this screen, out there, as does 99%, 99.999% of everything that is, is out there in inner space, in outer space, beyond the frame that our limited, conscious, rational brains can comprehend beyond the frame. It's, it's not in this screen. It's out there. This is a tiny fragment of reality, and we need to make peace with the unknown, with the beautiful unknown, which we cannot do when we have deep, overwhelming traumas that threaten to take us down to re-trigger and 
incapacitate us because we have no help and grounding to navigate these terrains which are also these terrains that are also out there so join me join me in a technology of circling join me by taking your hsp test are you highly sensitive 10 minutes what is your ACE score? 10 minutes. Learning about trauma. Take time to breathe and learn. The body keeps the score, healing trauma. Breathe into that. Learn about it. Practice at the edges. Perhaps do some EMDR. Perhaps read a book on family constellation. Perhaps begin painting. Perhaps begin making noise. Perhaps have your own circle. There's a chemistry that happens between the witness and the person in a camera. I'm looking at a phone right now, a phone, a six inch screen. And I'm relating to an other who's watching me talk about these things. We have many personas within us and we have a witness that when we watch what we're saying, there's a witness present, and there are things that can be said and done and created in the presence of our own or another's witness that cannot be said and done without that. When we get lost into it's just me. And a camera, if you're looking at your face, be it a mirror or a camera, recording or not, doesn't matter. When you talk to someone and they're watching you, there is a space holding in that chemistry. You can prepare your sounds, your journal, your dreams. You can open these doorways to prepare yourself for the magic that can only be released in a circle. Thank you.